Hey, I'm Nathaniel Foss, and I'm a professional archaeologist, and this channel is devoted to the archaeology of North America, especially in the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands. This is part two of my video on lithic technology, so if you missed the first one, I recommend going back and watching that first. There's also a video where I demonstrate how to make a spear point from raw rock to the final notches, and I'll be referring to both of those in this video. And you can find the links to those down in the description. Now, just to recap, last time I talked about what kinds of chipstone tools there are, how they're made, and what they're made out of. I also talked about how the shapes and textures we see on flakes allow us to identify them as artifacts and figure out what people were doing on a site. But the, the whole thing is very, was, well, that whole thing was very flake oriented, and there's a reason for that. Depotage analysis is really the foundation of all the other aspects of lithic analysis, and you have to understand that first before more moving forward with tools. This video is going to mostly deal with the class of artifacts that field archaeologists call PPKs, or projectile point knives. Most people call these arrowheads, but really they're mostly spears and knives and not arrows. You'll hear some archaeologists insist that like an atlatl dart is a different thing from a spear, but I'm not really one to split that hair. An atlatl dart is really just a spear that you throw with an atlatl. Um, so morphological analysis. Probably the easiest jumping off point uh, for PPKs is the morphological analysis. This is basically just taking the artifact and considering its shape attribute by attribute. So just to get you oriented, the stabby stabby part is called the distal end, and the part that would be attached to a handle or a shaft is the proximal end. It's important to understand that the distal end is much more uh, free to be modified once it's been made, and it can be resharpened in various different ways. If the tip snaps off, that can be reworked to be symmetrical or not. It can be retouched bifacially or unifacially, which we call beveled in this case, you know, whatever. As long as the distal end can still be used to get some kind of a job done, it can, you know, it's not going to get thrown away necessarily. It, you know, it can keep being used. So we'll sometimes find these drills that were really obviously PPKs at one point based on what's going on on the proximal end, but they've been used up and repurposed until they finally have to be thrown away. I've also seen scrapers and chisels and other, other kinds of artifacts made out of old PPKs, so the, the use life on these things can go very long and go through a lot of different stages. The proximal end, though, isn't quite so free in its, its use life. The base of the point uh, has to fit into the you know, handle or the shaft or whatever it's being socketed into. If it doesn't fit, then it's not useful. And there are a lot, it's a lot easier to make a new point than it is to make a new handle or to modify an old one. And this is part of why the haft elements on PPKs stay so similar over such long periods of time. You know, centuries, sometimes, you know, centuries, sometimes thousands of years in rare cases. It's, it's kind of a modular technology and the parts have to fit together in order for them to work. So if we take any given PPK or fragment of one and examine it, there are certain things that we can say about it. Incidentally, if you look in the description, there's a link to a classic type guide called Cambrin and Hulse that has illustrations of the different attributes of uh, projectile points, and they, they also illustrate the kind of variations on all of them. Um, and that's in the first, you know, three or four pages, I want to say. So, the, like I said, the blade can be asymmetrical or asymmetrical. If you look down the length of it so that the distal end is pointed toward you, you might find that it's, you know, flattened on one side and convex at the other, or biconvex or possibly beveled. There's, like, a lot of different cross-section possibilities. The proximal end might be stemmed, it might be notched, it might be lancelet, and lancelet just means that the blade comes down somewhat parallel until it meets the base of it, and there's not like a notch or anything like that. Um, usually on lancelet points, the area that's going to be wound is, is um, the blade is ground down on that like lowest inch or two, so that it uh, the blade doesn't end up cutting, you know, the, the sinew or whatever cord it is being used to wind the point onto the haft, or the knife onto the handle. Um, if it's, it's notched, then there are a lot of possibilities there too. It can be side notched, corner notched, or basal notched. Uh, 
Um, and if it's a stem type, then that stem can be, you know, expanding stemmed or uh, contracting or it can be straight sided. Okay, so I realized that morphological analysis is going to make a whole lot more sense if I actually do some. So I'm going to take a few points that I've made and a couple of replicas that we've got kicking around the lab and just kind of run through it. So starting from the distal end, so you've got proximal and distal. The mirror is the main body. And you have kind of this more excurvate blade shape here. It could have been more straight across, could have been more incurvate, but this is an excurvate blade. Not really serrated. There's a little bit of that going on with these parallel leg scars that you see running along here. But not really actual deep teeth going on. We have corner notches on either side and the base is excurvate also. In this case, not so much barbs per se, but because it's not a stem type, the shoulder isn't quite appropriate to talk about. We also have a fairly straight barb shape. It could have flared out further that way, but this one doesn't. And if we kind of look down the proximal land, you can see this really clearly on this um, printed reproduction, is this beveled cross section where it's been retouched along this direction and then upwards this direction. And that does a few things, but it's, it's really well associated with earlier sites, so Dalton, early archaic, that kind of time period. Now to contrast that, here is a Morrow Mountain Point that I made. It is made out of quartz. I've shown this in another video, I'm pretty sure. It's pretty chunky, Not was not fun to really make. But this one also has kind of a, um, a more obtuse blade shape. The edge is more excurvate. It's got a fairly straight shoulder and then a fairly rounded contracting stem with flat-ish base. It's not exactly perfectly flat, but I would put that in a flat base, round or contracting stem category. And if you look at it from this direction, you can see I was not able to get rid of this big hump on here, but this side is flat. This side is, uh, is more curved. It's been bifacially reworked along this way, so across this face and across this face. So I would go with plano convex on this cross section type, but definitely bifacially reworked. This one is obsidian. Actually, that's dacite. Yeah, it's some dacite I got in New Mexico. Again, excurvate blade, um, more of a plano convex. You see, it's fairly flat down here and fairly curved up top. Plano convex cross section with more of a bifacially retouched as opposed to that more caramel colored point that was beveled retouch. Fairly square shoulder, slightly expanding stem. Some people might still put this in a straight stem category. Um, and fairly flat base. I wouldn't put that as a rounded or excurvate base. This one's a Cumberland. It is fully fluted only on the one side though goes, you know, three quarters of the way up. Got this one channel scar, flute scar. This one is a lancelet type, which again just means that it doesn't have a shoulder, it doesn't have a stem, it's not notched or anything. The blade just kind of follows seamlessly down to the base. Um, and then the, kind of this area here would be abraded so that any kind of cordage or whatever doesn't get cut uh, when it gets hafted. It's got an incurvate base, kind of flared shape down there on the ears. And that's typical of uh, both Beaver Lakes and Cumberlands. They're basically the same thing. They have this kind of fishtail shape to them but the Beaver Lake is not fluted and the Cumberland is. Sometimes on both sides, but in this uh, this example, only one side. 
very acute angle to the distal end. And you might call that biconvex. Some people would call that median ridged. I, you know, uh, I could see that going going either way with it. Certainly not plano convex. Certainly not rhomboid or, or beveled. So here's one that's actually got some damage to it. Um, we've got another X curve eight blade. Those are fairly common. This one's a little straighter, not quite symmetrical, but we've got the remnants of some basal notches, which is common for uh, archaic types like Eva. There's another type called Calf Creek that has the, these basal notches. They're very thin and they run really deep up the, uh, the base. And we've also got a broken off stem there that you might be able to see. Put my hand behind it, it's easier. But yeah, that's snapped off that way. We would call that a half snap. If that had happened up, up around in this area, it would have been called a lateral snap or a lat snap. And you've got the barbs that are not, not exactly pointed, but they're also both broken on either end. And that, you know, that's still usable up until the point that that, that basal snap happened. Um, that would have still been usable. So we find, you know, points that once had barbs that have had them completely worked off over the course of retouching over and over again. Just to make the point that just because a tool starts out a certain way doesn't mean it's, it, it's going to end up that way as it gets used. And this one is more bifacially worked on this side and is kind of um, a slightly beveled on this side. That, that could be evened up a little bit. But again, that doesn't really negatively affect the utility of the piece that much, if at all. Here's an interesting one. It would depend on where I found this because it would mean two totally different things. If I found this in somewhere like North Carolina, Georgia, something like that, this contracting stem, really deep contracting stem with a rounded, uh, rounded base, be a type two moral mountain. But if I found this in Texas or Arkansas, this would be a classic Gary point knife type. The, um, the Garys are later than the Mora Mountains. Garys are supposed to be late archaic into the woodland, so maybe some middle archaic here and there. But in uh, in the Carolinas, Georgia kind of area, these the the Type Two Mora Mountains are late middle woodland, and that's just about it. Maybe a little bit, or ma late middle archaic rather. Um, yeah, these are late middle archaic, and that's just about it. You might get them creeping into the late archaic, but not that not that I've read about. Not a particularly uh, symmetrical blade shape. This one's obviously taking a little bit of damage. You can see the nicks there and there. Kind of irregular biconvex from uh, maybe maybe more flat from here over, and then a little bit of a beveling. Uh, over here on, on this edge from, from retouching down in this kind of direction. Here's another one that, that I made. Another This one's an obsidian piece. Basically notched, very small uh, curved stem, um, contracting stem, more rounded base than anything else. Straight sides. I don't really make those very often. This one's actually a, a true straight-sided piece with a fairly obtuse angle on the on the blade, so broadhead kind of at lateral dart. I'd still hesitate to say this is an arrow. If I found this, it would be, I'd consider this to be too big, too fat. Um, but looking down it, flattened to biconvex, pretty, pretty textbook for that. Very bifacially retouched on that as well. Here's a good Dalton example, um, another lancelet type, not unlike the the, um, the Cumberland, fairly straight rather than excurvate blade shape. The tip on this one, we're looking at probably something more of like a, a, a broad style tip rather than an acute style tip or uh, something more obtuse. Um, incurvate 
basal shape, fairly classic for Dalton. Sometimes these will uh, flare out a little bit, not unlike the Beaver Lakes and the Cumberlands. No real stem, no shoulder to talk about. And looking kind of down it, fairly, it's easier to see on, with the light side up. As biconvex to maybe, maybe some people would call this plano convex. That is a little bit flatter over on this side, but. And also you can see that this one is beveled also, kind of like that caramel one where it's been retouched in this direction and then also coming down in this direction. So you have this kind of rhombozoidal uh, retouch pattern, which is fairly common for, like I said, for late paleo Dalton kind of, uh, kind of projectile technology and knife technology. There's some ideas about why that might be. Maybe it like twists. Once it makes impact with uh, animal flesh, it starts to uh, rifle and spiral. But it also just seems to be a much more efficient way of resharpening the tool that ends up, you, you get a longer uh, use life out of it than by facially repairing your tools or re resharpening or retouching. It's the combination of these kinds of morphological attributes that we use to define point types like Morrow Mountain or Calf Creek or Clovis and then figure out where those types appear and during what time periods. So if you saw the video on Dust Cave you might remember that archaeologists there found that the sequence went where like the oldest points were lancelet and then there was a period where a lot of side notched types were made and then straight stem types and then uh, contracting stemmed uh, types later on. So there's some things that this classification system is really good at and some things that we have to be really careful about. It's very useful for me when I'm working in an unfamiliar region because if I find a point type that I'm not familiar with, I have a vocabulary that I can use to describe it in the field notes and people in the lab will understand what I'm talking about and they can reconstruct you know, what typology is associated with that kind of suite of attributes. It's also really helpful for reconstructing how these attributes change in frequency over time and space. But unfortunately, it's very easy to forget that a point type is something that was invented by modern archaeologists based on attributes that we consider to be important, relevant. If people living, you know, 7,000 years ago were handed a bag full of projectile points and asked to sort them out by what, you know, what they thought the types were, it's entirely likely that they would group some things together that we consider separate and divide, you know, one of our defined types into, you know, multiple different kinds. Also, types don't necessarily correspond to ethnic groups or any other form of identity. They certainly can reflect identity of the, the user in certain circumstances, but there's really very rarely any reason to believe that a point type is like a cultural signature of, a, of an ethnic group. It's extremely easy to slip in that kind of mindset if you're not careful. There are a couple of other more high-tech forms of analysis that I want to touch on really briefly. One is called useware analysis, and this technique goes back to kind of the Cold War era. Um, but what this is doing is high-powered microscopes can be used on stone tools to identify polish patterns that build up on the cutting surfaces when they're being used. And different materials will produce different polish patterns. So meat will produce one kind of polish, uh, you know, plant fibers will produce another, wood, leather, bone, they all produce their own kinds of uh, useware polishes. And this is how we know that an artifact called the Alred axe wasn't actually an axe used for cutting wood at all. It was a digging tool because it's got use wear polish observed on the working edge that corresponds to being run through soil for, you know, repeatedly over and over and over again. And it takes hours of, of work to make use wear polish build up on most material types. Not so much, much obsidian. Obsidian is much softer, like I said, than flint or, or chertz. So microwares analysis has uh, really allowed us to move past the whole, it looks like an ax, therefore it must be an ax argument, um, and provide real direct evidence for the function of these, these artifacts. Now, the other technique I want to talk about is lipid analysis. The brass tacks on this is that stone tools have a certain degree of porosity to them, and the napping pr process produces these very tiny cracks in the blade surface. So 
these can absorb fats from animals that they were used to hunt or butcher. So chemical analysis of the fat composition in those micro cracks can be used to figure out what animals specifically were being used, uh, what were being hunted or butchered. I've had to recover artifacts for lipid analysis myself on certain jobs, and you can't touch them with your hands if you want to do this. So the, the oils in your skin can contaminate it. So what we have to do is we have to leave the artifact in place, dig a pedestal around it, and then cut the artifact out and then package it up, usually in like foil or something, with the dirt that was surrounding it in the first place so that no new contaminants will spoil that sample. All right, so that's all I've got for this one. If you've got questions, you can leave those in the comments section. And as always, thank you for watching. Thank you.